Hello. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, it's a real thrill to be here. Um, I'm looking forward just to the next 40 minutes or so, just to kind of tell you a bit about my story, my journey over the last uh, few years. Um, and we'll, we should have a bit of time at the end for any questions if anyone wants to ask me anything. Um, so I'll start with when I was kind of at school stroke university. Um, I always wanted to to go out and make some change in the world. My sort of teenage rebellion was like listening to Rage Against the Machine and uh, giving my dad a hard time when he was trying to make money in his business. Um, and I always wanted to go out and try and make some kind of difference. Um, so I went to university and I studied politics and economics. Um, and my ambition upon leaving university was to try and go and get a job as a civil servant for the government. I want, I, my dream was to be a government economist, a, pictured myself maybe working for DFID and advising developing countries on sort of policies around economic growth or something like that. So I, I left university and I applied for this graduate scheme uh, job with the government and it was a great big long six month application process where you had to do different psychometric tests online and then if you passed those you had to go to different assessment centres and I got through to the second last stage of that which was a days long assessment centre in London. And that was a day long where they sort of tested your knowledge of economics and they recommended a textbook about that thick uh, prior to going down. And I was so determined to get the job, I read it back to front and I went down and I passed that stage. Um, so then the final stage was another days long assessment centre in London where they tested more kind of your sort of personality traits. It was things like your communication skills and your leadership and your teamwork and all that kind of thing. And then after that six month process, I just got a single sentence email that came into me uh, and it just said, sorry, you've not been successful, you didn't get the job. So I was a bit kind of deflated um, to sort of pass the technical economics bit, but to fail kind of squarely on grounds of personality was a bit of a sore one. Um, and I thought, oh, do you know what? I don't really fancy having to jump through these kind of graduate scheme hoops anymore. So maybe I might try and set up my own business. So I brainstormed a few different business ideas and they all seemed to revolve around events. So I decided to set up an events company that I called Capital Events, uh, based in Edinburgh. So the first event that I ever dreamed up um, was a fashion show that I put on during the Edinburgh Festival that I called the Festival Fashion Show. Um, so to put that into a bit of context, I was 21 at the time and I was single, and I thought a fashion show might be quite a good chat about it. Um, <laughs> So I organized that and um, then the I took this really big gamble and actually I phoned up the SECC and um, I asked if I could put on an exhibition which I brainstormed this thing called Scotland Ski and Snowboard Show and I put on an exhibition in Hall 3 here which is maybe one of the halls you're using today and then I spent the best part of a year frantically trying to sell exhibition space to ski companies um, which thankfully just about enough of them bought, so we managed to sell a few tickets and we just about survived. We did that for a couple of years. And I called that Scotland Ski and Snowboard Show. So I was in a bit of a habit of giving things a title and putting Scotland's in front of it to establish a bit of credibility. Uh, and one of the events that I came up with um, five years ago was an event called the Scottish Business Awards. Um, so that event's now five years old and it's um, been pretty miraculous really in the sense we've brought all these kind of world leading figures to Scotland um, so it really got put on the map in its second year when I speculatively invited President Bill Clinton to come and speak um, and we ended up doing a kind of deal where we'd make a big donation to the Clinton Foundation and he came and spoke and then the year after that it was Richard Branson and then a couple of years ago George Clooney and then Leonardo DiCaprio and the event grew bigger and bigger and in the George Clooney year um, there was 2,100 people confirmed to come and the guys at the venue the EICC said Josh do you realise that breaks a record in Scotland? for the largest sit-down dinner gathering in history here. So they, they said the last time 2,000 people gathered to have dinner in Scotland was for the coronation of King James VI. Um, wow, um, shows you the pool of George Clooney. Um, but when the, it reached that scale and we had all these kind of world leading figures, people kind of asked me, Josh, how on earth did you get involved in the Scottish Business Awards? So if I was really kind of honest, I had to kind of say to them, well, I created an event and I called it the Scottish Business Awards and I think because it was called the Scottish Business Awards everybody just kind of assumed it was really prestigious and it had been around for a long time and you know we just didn't really correct that assumption. Um, 
in the first year of the event, obviously it's got no prestige because it's never happened before. Um, so, you know, how do you establish credibility for an award ceremony when it's never happened before? So in the first year, we managed to get 800 people in the room, um, which made it the biggest one in Scotland for that year. And we managed to get all the kind of great and the good in Scotland. So all the knights of the realm and the multi-millionaires and billionaires uh, attended the event. So Sir Tom Hunter and Sir Tom Farmer and Michelle Moan and Jim McCall and all these illustrious people from the Scottish business community all attended. And again, sometimes people ask me now, Josh, you're in your mid-twenties, how on earth did you, did you manage to get all these prestigious business leaders to attend your event in its first year? And again, I have to kind of say, being honest, we nominated them all for awards and they all pitched up. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, so when all these kind of crazy things happened and all these Hollywood A-listers and ex-presidents came to Scotland for this event that I dreamed up, then a bit of a strange realization dawned on me that like, when I grew up, when I went to school um, and when you're growing up in life, you kind of get told that the world is the way that it is and you'll have your education and you'll have different opportunities and this is your career options. But what I discovered over that time is that the world is actually really malleable and if you want to go out there and influence things and change things, then you can and people will buy into that. So kind of in line with this way of thinking, when I was first setting up the events business uh, over five years, uh, about seven, six, seven years ago, um, I came across a book by a guy called Professor Muhammad Yunus, um, who is this amazing guy. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006, based in Bangladesh. And Professor Yunus wrote this book uh, that I, I don't know where I found it, but I picked it up, and in it he described an idea that he called a social business. So he talked about how in his native Bangladesh, he set up over 50 different companies, and some of them went on to become really large, billion dollar businesses, but he never owned a single share in one of them. So every single company that he ever set up was never for the traditional purpose of trying to maximize a return for himself or for investors. It was always because he kept seeing these seemingly intractable social challenges in Bangladesh, and his solution every time was to try and create a business format to tackle that particular problem. So by this time, I just set up my first little business, and I had this bit of a passion for entrepreneurship, and this book just really rang a bell with me that you could set up in business and be entrepreneurial, but do it not for the purpose that everyone tells you what it's about making money, but do it for more of a social objective, which kind of connected to, I felt, who I was as a person and what I always wanted to do when I was younger. So, to cut a long story short, I wrote off to Professor Eunice and asked if I could have a meeting with him. Um, and they eventually wrote back to me and they said, we went back and forth and they kind of said, if you want to come to Bangladesh, we can offer you a meeting in October. So this was back in 2011. Um, so myself and my ex-girlfriend accepted that meeting and we traveled to Bangladesh in October 2011 and we met Professor Yunus, and we spent a week there and we toured around his different social businesses. And we were so inspired by that trip and, and meeting this guy that we decided to really change the path of our lives um, and try and open up our own social business. Um, so I managed to sell the ski show that I'd created here um, for a sum of 40,000 pounds and we invested all that money into opening up a tiny little sandwich shop uh, in Edinburgh um, on Rose Street, which we called Social Bite. So, the concept of Social Bite evolved quite quickly to, to, the, to what it is now, but effectively now the concept of the business is that all the profits we make get reinvested back in the, the common good, back in, in social good in, in the community. And there's two aspects specifically within that um, that the business does to, to make an impact in the community. So one is we run a pay it forward system where customers can come in and whilst they're getting their own lunch or their own coffee, they can buy for anything on the menu for homeless people to come and get later. Um, and the third aspect, which I think is the most powerful one, is that roughly a quarter of our workforce are people that have previously struggled with homelessness themselves. So people you would have maybe seen selling the big issue or begging in the city centres, we bring into employment. Um, so we've managed to expand Social Bite over the course of the last five years. So that we now have shops across Glasgow, Edinburgh um, and Aberdeen. We employ over 100 people and a quarter of those people are people you would have previously seen uh, struggling in a situation of homelessness. Um, so I've got a little video now uh, which will play um, about Social Bite, which should ho hopefully get the message across. So 
Social Bite is a small chain of sandwich and coffee shops that spans all three major cities in Scotland. 100% of our profits go to different charities that we've chosen. So far, we've raised tens of thousands of pounds for causes in Scotland and overseas. Social Bite runs a pay it forward system. Which means that customers can come in and as well as getting their own lunch, they can pay something forward for homeless people to come and get later. Homeless people can come in, collect the ticket and get a free tea, a coffee and a sandwich. We don't lose any money, but you can do something nice for a homeless person in the community. The good thing about the pay it forward system is that they don't have to go to a church hall or a soup van. So they can kind of feel like members of society and feel like customers. I think the really special thing about Social Bite is that a quarter of our workforce are people that have previously struggled with homelessness themselves. I've been dealt really good cards in life and I've had so many opportunities that perhaps I've not even been aware of. The guys I come across from a homeless background had terrible cards dealt to them when they came into the world. My dad used to batter my mum and he used to hit me as well. And then we got took into care when I was 11. A lot of people probably think that most homeless people are on drink or drugs. Some people look through you rather than at you. Didn't they feel like a person? I felt like a, I don't know, invisible. Since I started working at Social Bite, I've gained bags of confidence. I've got something to look forward to every day, and it just makes me feel like I'm doing something worthwhile. We realised that putting people in poverty to work and providing resources for people to fund themselves and their families is the way to end the cycle of poverty. My name's Sonny and I work for Social Bite. I was unemployed and uh, I was trying to get a job and to be honest, I had no job prospects at the time, so I was in and out of prison and taking drugs and stuff. I was just trying to get myself sorted and when I met Alice, she gave me the chance of having a job, so obviously I grabbed it with both hands and I've still got it. <laughs> People in the very worst situations in Scotland have a chance, finally, to be included in the system. Now we've expanded and opened a high-end restaurant called Home in partnership with a local restaurant group here in Edinburgh called Maison Bleu. They run it with the same excellent food and service and everything you'd expect from a really, really great restaurant. Diners are able to pay something forward. It's a cruel world. You have to think about other people and try and do something to make things better for them. Homeless people are invited every Monday to come and sit in the restaurant and have their order taken by the waiters and have their food brought to them. Sort of no queuing, no soup kitchens, no church halls. Feel like human beings and feel like part of society. I find that they've always been really fair with us, you know what I mean, and service always been nice. I had the beef stroganoff, and the, the meat was absolutely perfect, and the mash was nice and creamy. And better than what I could do. I could never afford to, to come to a restaurant like this, so for somebody else to pay for it, it's amazing. I'm Dean Gassabi, founder of Maison Bleu Restaurant and uh, partner with Social Bite, being able to help, making a difference in their life. I think it's not just about feeding the people here on, on, on a Monday or a Tuesday. It's about bringing them over here, training them, and making something out of their lives. All right, my name's Joseph Hart. I work at Social Bite, and my role's like training to do all the cooking to be head chef. That was me when I was on the street a few years ago, and that's me now in the kitchen. The whole process is about trying to break that exclusion and create inclusion. So that starts with just inviting them in for free food and culminates in the offer of a job. We need a different mindset and we need to have more patience and a little bit more of a proactive nature, perhaps, towards the poverty that's right here in our country. If you give homeless people a chance, then they can contribute to society in the same way that anybody else can. It does make you feel proud, because if it wasn't for them, I'd probably still be on the street, I think. They make you have a normal routine and a normal life, and they make you feel like a normal person. I'll be forever grateful to Alice and Josh for that. Um, my social media has totally changed my life for the better. Thank you very much. Still gets me that video. Um, so yeah, so it's been a really kind of whirlwind journey over the last five years since we uh, set Social Bite up. And I've learned an awful lot over that process. Um, and I've learned a lot about the issue of homelessness. Um, 
because we didn't really know anything about it when we sort of got into it. And one of the things I've learned about homelessness is that if you are in, in that situation of society of homeless or big issue seller or rough sleeping or begging, then the concept of like social mobility, it doesn't really exist as far as I can tell. Um, to illustrate that point, the first guy we ever took on from a homeless background was a young guy called Pete. Um, so when we first set up Social Bite, the original concept didn't really have much to do with homelessness. It was to try and make a profit, and then we'd selected three charities to distribute the profits to. But we'd just opened up the first shop, and we'd be opening up and closing down, and we met this young guy called Pete who sold the big issue on the street corner just outside the shop. And we kind of got chatting to him over the first couple of weeks, and we asked him how he became homeless and what his story was. And after about two weeks, he kind of plucked up the courage himself and asked if he could have a job. So we sort of thought, well, the whole point of us being here is to try and do something good, so that's quite a good thing to do, to give this guy a job. So we gave him a job in the kitchen. Um, and I think we offered him a job for 16 hours a week. Um, but he just loved being part of you know, a, an actual business and coming out from the cold, literally. And he used to want to volunteer for an additional 16 hours a week. Um, and he just worked super hard, super reliable. And so when a full-time job came up, it was kind of the natural decision to offer it to Pete. So we gave him a full-time job. And when he got that job, um, the local Edinburgh newspaper, the Edinburgh Evening News, ran a story about it. So it was like a little full-page local good news story about this young guy, Pete, who sold the Big Issue magazine outside the shop, and now he's got a job inside the shop. So. That was the first little bit of PR we ever got, and we were quite excited. We thought it might give us a little lift in the business. But the next day after that, something kind of strange happened in that almost every single national newspaper in Scotland picked up that story um, and ran a similar full-page good news story. So the Herald, the Sun, the Daily Record, the Scotsman, they all ran this big story about this young guy, Pete, who sold the biggest show outside the shop, and now he's got a job inside the shop which again, as a new business, we were like really excited. We thought this really gave us a boost. But looking back now in hindsight, I kind of think it's a bit strange, really. I mean, all that really happened was a young, able person went from selling a magazine to washing dishes. I mean, how on earth is that a news story, let alone one to gain national news coverage? But it just goes to show that it just doesn't really happen. If you are in that demographic of society, then your chances of breaking into any kind of mainstream, even just a dishwasher, are pretty remote. And this is where I think we collectively have a responsibility as a society to look at these people who are marginalized and isolated from the system and haul them in. Um, and I think education has an absolutely fundamental role in that because any homeless person I've ever met, and I've met hundreds, typically that journey always started in childhood and they were dealt pretty terrible cards um, by comparison to the most of us. So I'll tell you a story. Um, I, d I never like to paint too rosy a picture about Social Bite, and I think it's important to try and highlight some of the difficult management decisions that we face in running a business like this. Um, so I'll tell you a story about a guy that we took on called, called John. So this was about three years ago. Um, we had a bit of an issue in Social Bite with theft. So little things kept going missing. So one day, 20 pounds went missing from one of the tills, and then the next day, 10 pounds went missing from another member of staff's wallet. A few days later, somebody's iPod went missing, and we thought, somebody, somebody must be stealing from us. So there was a few people we kind of suspected that it might be, but this guy, John, he just didn't really come into the equation of our thinking. He was just such a nice guy, didn't really contemplate it could be him. But after a bit of time passing, the coincidences kept kind of stacking up in whichever shop John was working in, that's where things would tend to go missing from it, and whichever shift he was rotated on for, that's when things would typically go missing. And it kind of got to the stage where we thought it just has to be John. It was the only really logical explanation. Uh, we didn't really have any evidence, but um, it just it was the only possible scenario really so one day I decided to go in and try and kind of bluff him a bit and force an admission so I went into our Shandwick play shop in Edinburgh where he was working and I said um, John can I have a word please and we went and sat in one of the little booths and I said John look something I've not told you I've not told anyone is that we've had covert cameras put in the back of the shop and I said we've caught you on film stealing from us and stealing from your colleagues 
I said, if you admit it now, then there'll be no consequences and we can support you with whatever it is you need help with. But if you deny it now, then there'll be some really, really serious consequences. And John looked me right in the eyes and he said, show me the footage. He said, if you have footage, show me it. He said, because I swear on my life, it wasn't me. He said, you've given me this chance. I would never betray that. I swear to you, it wasn't me. And I looked him right in the eyes. He looked me right back for what must have been 20 seconds. And I remember I went back to the office that day and said, it's definitely not John, 100%. I said, he didn't even flinch when I mentioned the cameras. He looked me straight in the eyes and promised it wasn't him. I said, it's not him, it must be somebody else. So a couple of weeks go by and we do a lot of um, corporate catering with Social Bite. So we do sandwich platters to different offices in the different cities. And this one day we had uh, an event on at a law firm and the manager asked John if he would drop around the sandwich platters. That was fine, they were dropped off. The next day, Alice was phoning around the different clients to get a bit of feedback on the food um, and the service. So she phoned this particular client and said, hello, I'm just phoning from Social Bite. I just wanted to check everything went okay with your order yesterday. And the receptionist said, yeah, the food was really good. Um, one slight issue though is that the other receptionist who was working yesterday, her mobile phone went missing. So we think whoever's dropped off the sandwiches has stolen her phone. So I thought, that little fucker. <laughs> it was John. So I sort of marched into the shop and said, John, let's go for a walk. So we went and sat on one of the benches in Princess Street Gardens and I said, you took that woman's phone and you lied to me. And initially tried to kind of deny it, but after a bit of time he broke down and got really upset and sort of owned up to it all. And what came out then that we hadn't known before um, is that John, he was in his late 30s now, but at that stage, um, but he, he told us then that from the age of 16 he'd developed a really serious gambling addiction. Um, so everything that he'd been taking had been going straight into Ladbrokes and straight into the roulette machines and the phone within 24 hours had already been pawned and the money had already been gambled. So at this stage we're kind of faced with a bit of a dilemma, a bit of a difficult decision in terms of what we do. Certainly my instinct and a lot of the advice I was given at the time would be to sack him. Obviously the trust had not only been broken with myself but with his colleagues and it did seem like an almost impossible situation to get past. But where it gets a bit more challenging um, and I'm sure you guys experience this in the teaching profession, is that when you are trying to do something like this and take on people um, who are from this kind of really troubled background and have been really isolated, then you have to, where you can, try and understand their behavior within the context of the lives that they've had, and you have to, where you can, try and put yourself in their shoes. So John um, had a childhood, as I say, almost everyone that came, I've ever met from a homeless background typically grew up through the care system. They typically had some really terrible cards dealt to them um, and John was no different. So John from the age of zero till seven didn't live with his parents but with friends of his parents who were drug addicts and alcoholics. Him and his two siblings used to be locked in a small dark room and they have a, had a bath bucket in the middle to do the toilet in and they were fed porridge oats and that was his life from the age of zero till seven. At the age of seven, there was a house fire. Um, one of John's siblings died in that house fire and John and his other sibling got taken into the care system. They got bounced around different children's homes and foster's homes and at the age of 16, he became homeless. And I start to think, man, I can't even begin to put myself in this guy's shoes. And then you start to think, if that's been your childhood and you have if had none of the love or the nourishment or the care that most of us take for granted, and you get to the age of 16 and you go into the bookies and you bet a bit of money and you win and you get that first buzz of adrenaline and happiness and joy, then what kind of addiction is possible to take hold of you? So I heard a quote a little while ago from a guy called Father Gregory Boyle who runs a similar kind of organization in the United States and this quote really stuck with me and I found it really profound and I try and let it inform me and the senior management team when we're faced with this kind of dilemma. Um, so what Father Gregory Boyle said was, what we need in society is a compassion that stands in awe of the burdens that the poor have to carry rather than in judgment at the way that they carry them. 
And I found that really profound in thinking about John and all these guys I come across from a homeless background. When I actually stop and think about it, my only rational response can really be awe. Because I kind of conclude if it was me in their shoes, if it was me that had been dealt their cards, then I'm really not confident I would still be on my feet, let alone trying to turn up to work every day to turn my life around and take a different path. So to conclude, what we did with John is we decided to suspend him for three months. Uh, during that time, we helped him. We teamed up with a local homelessness charity called the Serenians, uh, and they started providing us with a counselor every week. So John and the other guys started getting weekly counseling, which made a big difference. And we, teamed, uh, we found a local Gamblers Anonymous group, and John started going to that every week, and he really loved it. After three months, uh, we re-employed him back in our central production kitchen in Livingston, um, and he worked really solely, solely there for almost three years. Um, and in late November 2015, John was part of a team of five guys, all from homeless backgrounds, who all had the pleasure of cooking lunch for uh, George Clooney. So, a happy ending. Hollywood ending. Um, so, John actually went on to, to leave Social Bite, and he, he ended up getting a job with quite a posh hotel on Princess Street in Edinburgh. Um, so, I was super proud of him for that. And they obviously asked me for a reference, and didn't mention a lot of that stuff, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's doing really well now. So yeah, so um, I'll kind of uh, draw this to a, a close by telling you a bit about our next plans and, and, and end with inviting you all to participate in, in one, of those, one of those projects. So the first thing I'll tell you about um, before that is our next kind of big project that we're working on, which is effectively to take this experience of working with a, a a lot of homeless people over five years, and kind of foray into the world of accommodation. So we came up with a plan to basically build a small village uh, called the Social Bite Village. So that basically came from increasingly chatting to people from homeless backgrounds and learning more about the issue and how the sort of status quo and how we as a society currently respond to homelessness. Um, in terms of temporary accommodation. So at the moment in the big cities, if you find yourself homeless, then the way it works is you'll go to the homelessness office and you will present as homeless. Then the council has a statutory obligation to find you some kind of temporary accommodation or temporary shelter, which typically take two forms. They take either the forms of hostels or much more often than not, they take the form of these things called homelessness bed and breakfasts, which is a bit of a misleading term because it's not a bed and breakfast as we would know it, um, but it's a B&B &B designed specifically for homeless people that's typically privately owned. They have a single bed and a kettle. They have a curfew where they have to be out of that accommodation by 10 in the morning. They can't get back in until 6, and they have to be in before 10 p.m. If any of those particular time curfews are missed, then people will get kicked out of that particular accommodation. They'll have to represent and they'll get lug their bags and they get placed somewhere else. Um, that was originally just designed to be for a few nights until someone could be placed somewhere more, more permanent, but we're at a situation now where the average waiting time in a B&B is between 18 and 24 months. So you find people are spending two, often two years in this complete isolated limbo of a life that effectively what we're doing there as a society is writing them off. The chances of them kind of reintegrating after that period are pretty slim. Um, which wouldn't all be so bad if it wasn't so expensive. It costs Edinburgh Council and other local authorities are the same, on average, £47 per person per night um, to house people in those temporary accommodations. So, so in Edinburgh alone, it's over £6 million a year cost, um, which all goes into the profits, really, of private, pretty unscrupulous landlords who are kind of making a profit, effectively, off the back of homelessness. Um, so. It doesn't really benefit the councils, and the councils know it, they're just kind of stuck. It certainly doesn't benefit the individuals, and it just ben benefits um, these, these private sector landlords. So from that backdrop, we kind of thought perhaps we could do, do something a bit better than that. So we came up with this idea of trying to create a community-based village. We went to Edinburgh Council and asked if we could have some land to trial this, so they gave us 1.5 acres of land. Um, in an area of Edinburgh called Granton. And then we sought to find quite a low-cost, innovative, but really beautiful housing model that, that would work. So we managed to find a guy based in Linlithgow, a designer called Jonathan Avery, who created this beautiful little house uh, in his back garden, which is there. Um, so Jonathan worked with us to design a, a two-bedroom version of this. 
Um, so it's really nice. It's got a little wood burning fire in it, a little kitchenette. It's got two single bedrooms. Um, and we can build one of these for around £50,000. Um, so we fundraised last December and we managed to raise over half a million pounds to build 11 of these houses, as well as a central community hub. Um, the construction industry has been phenomenal at giving us things pro bono, so this project's all underway, the houses are all in production, and we're hopeful early 2018 to have the first residents move in. The idea is that 20 people will move into that community um, who would currently otherwise be in the hostels or the B&Bs. They'll stay there for a duration of roughly 12 to 18 months, during which time they'll get really intensive support uh, we've got a good partnership established with the local Edinburgh College, so whilst they're there they can get qualifications uh, and we're going to try and open up lots of doors with private sector employers um, so they can get work experience and work opportunities. Um, and then the idea is after 12 to 18 months they'll be supported into so a full-time tenancy and hopefully that'll come alongside a job and they'll just generally be in a position to be up and out of homelessness. To achieve that we're investing in five full-time employees, 24-7 security, um, and a whole raft of partnerships. And I think we can do all that and all that investment and resource for cheaper than the £47 per person per night. Um, so the logic is if we can achieve better outcomes for a cheaper price, then there's some uh, sensible conversations to be had with government and with local authorities to try and not make this a f solution to all of homelessness, but for a certain population within the homeless community, a really viable alternative to the B&Bs and the hostels. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that project. As I say, early next year, we're hoping to launch it. Um, the, f the final thing that I want to invite you all to get involved with um, is a big event that we're organizing this year, um, this December on December the 9th, called Sleep in the Park. So this event stemmed from when we were researching this village project. We started to understand a bit more about the statistics nationally of homelessness. Um, so in Edinburgh, at any one time, there's 800 people caught up in the B&Bs, um, and there's further people that rough sleep and sofa surf. In Scotland nationally, there are 11,000 homeless households, so there's about 20,000 individuals who are in a situation of homelessness, but some of them are couples and families, so it's about 11,000 households. So the one thing that struck me when I sort of understood those figures is that they're not that big. You know, Scotland's a pretty small nation. You know, we are a big village really, we can easily talk to the government, to the local authorities, to the private sector, to, we can collaborate within the third sector. And it just seems to me it's not beyond our wit as a nation to sort that out, to sort out accommodation and support and uh, get 11,000 households out of that situation. Um, you then obviously got the upstream issue to deal with, which is uh, where education has a pivotal role to try and intervene at the cases like John and all these people before they reach um, that situation of homelessness. But certainly in terms of dealing with the here and now, to me it seems uh, an absolutely achievable thing. So with that in mind, we decided to try and create a big mass, partici mass participation event that we're billing as the sort of live aid for homelessness in Scotland, where we're trying to invite 9,000 people to all come and sleep out on Saturday, the December, of 9th, December 9th in Princess Street Gardens in Edinburgh. Um, I just had a chat with John Swinney, so through pre bit of pressure, he's just confirmed, and I said I would be announcing that to everyone, so there you go. Um, and yeah, we're inviting people from all walks of life. The Church, Church of Scotland's getting behind it, um, the corporate communities, the local football teams, Hearts and Hibs, and we really want to open up the doors to it, to the educational community, so to high schools and universities, ed for kids, sixth formers, teachers, um, and to, to the university. So what I'm working on at the moment is to get places in it uh, funded for school kids, um, which I can tell you about. But I'll, I'll show you a quick video about the event um, as a bit of a pitch to you all. We're inviting you to join us and 9,000 others in Princess Street Gardens on the 9th of December for the world's largest ever sleep out. Sleep in the park, where you'll be joined by buskers, including Liam Gallagher, Deacon Blue, Frightened Rabbit and Amy McDonald. Comedy legend John Cleese will be performing a bedtime story and we'll have our breakfast rolls served by Rob Bryden and a host of Scottish Government Cabinet Ministers. Legendary activist Sir Bob Geldof will be sleeping out with us too. By raising funds and working together, we can act on a plan to eradicate homelessness in Scotland over a five-year period. By providing people with housing, rehabilitation 
job opportunities and the support they need to get back on their feet. We want to make Scotland an example for the whole world to follow. We're a small country, a nation of innovators. The statistics of homelessness in Scotland are not insurmountable. We can do this. We just need you. So, so that's it. So, ba so basically, we're going to tr effectively, to, to take part, people need to commit to raise £100, including an initial £50 donation. So I'm speaking with a couple of people at the moment, which I hope to actually have confirmed by the end of the day, to pay that initial £50 for anyone that's a, in, in school or university. Um, so effectively, we want to try and create 2,000 places at the event for young people that will be fully paid up. So the only thing they have to do is commit to raise £50. And then we'll be contacting all the head teachers of the different schools and other academic uh, institutions to give each school, if they want it, an allocation for pupils and teachers to take part in the event. So if you're interested, then either get in touch with us or hopefully we will have a bit of a campaign to really engage with the education system uh, and get in touch with you. Um, so that's kind of my story. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm going to finish with a quote um, that I always finish with um, from Steve Jobs, which hopefully kind of sums up the message I want to get across, uh, and then I'll have some time for questions if anyone wants to ask me anything. Um, I used to always read this quote, but I've given the talk a few times now, so I kind of know off by heart. Um, so here goes. Steve Jobs said, when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way that it is. And your life is just to live your life and try not to bash into the walls too much. But that is a very limited life. Life can be much broader when you discover one simple fact. And that is that everything around you that you call life was made up by people that are no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can build your own things that other people can use. Shake off this erroneous notion that life is just there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it, change it, make your mark upon it. When you learn that, you will never be the same again. And that's true. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Josh. Very inspiring, and I think um, lots of, of parallels with, with education that we're developing uh, throughout the Learning Festival as well. As Josh said, he's, uh, he's allowed a little bit of time for some questions. Um, so if you've got a question, just raise, raise your hand, and uh, we'll get a mic to you. We've got one down at the front here. Excellent. I was hugely impressed by your vision, but it hasn't come from nowhere. And one of the words that we heard on the screen was mindset. Where did you gain this mindset <coughs> so we can maybe share that with our young people? Um, I think, I don't know, like, I guess it's partly down to like family upbringing. My dad always, and my mum always used to say, you know, you can achieve anything. But I'm sure a lot of people kind of get told that, but I think, um, I don't know if it's something that I just had. I think it's learned, you know, and as you get a little success and stuff, like when a, that fashion show worked, that was the first little thing. And then the next, like every, the, I suppose I structured that talk in a way to say it was all one little footstep after the other. So there was never a vision to try and stimulate a movement to end homelessness. So there was never a vision to get into housing or there was never a vision to do any of that. It was just, we met a young guy that sold the big issue outside the shop. Um, and when that worked, we asked him if he knew anyone else, and he recommended his brother, who was also a big issue seller, then they recommended someone else, and then we introduced a pay-it-forward thing. And just by following one step after the other and gaining a bit of success, and also gaining support, you know, when you start to see people from all walks of life rally around you and support and think doors open that you could never have dreamed of, then, I don't know, you, you, you feel a snowball building, and it's just a case of capitalizing on that. So I think it's about instilling people with the belief that they can do anything. I think that whole Steve Jobs quote of, you know, the world was only created as we know it by people that are no smarter than us. I think if you can equip young people with that philosophy, it's really, really important and it's very true. Um, and then it's just a case of supporting them on their journey and, and they will meander their own path and, you know, I'm sure make a big difference in their particular areas. Um, so, yeah. Time for maybe another couple of questions. Oh, there's uh there's one over there, and then is there one at the back? Yep, there's one at the back. So, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> so we'll take, we'll take this one first, and then I'll come to the person in white. Hi, Josh. I'm, I'm Pauline Cumming, um, Broughton High School. Um, my school catchment area is in, um, is part of the Granton area, um, and that's where your fantastic homes are being built. Um, I'm just wondering what work you're doing to um, work with local people and young people to make sure that the homeless people who come to stay there are welcomed as part of that community. And I'm actually also wondering, is there a role for our school to work um, to support with that? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, that, that's a really good question. So I think like um, I've had a few conversations with the community council leader in that area and, and different people. And I think like one of it's a communication piece of there's a few nuances around the project, which maybe will make it a bit less daunting for people that might be daunted in the local area. So one is when any of the residents we're taking in, we're not taking in anyone with a present addiction issue. Um, or a mental health diagnosis. So in terms of the spectrum of homeless people, we're definitely going to people at the lower needs side of things. As I said, it's going to be very focused around like work and opportunity. So at least five days of a week, people will be out and about at the local college or at work placements. So I think like if people were to distill a, like a fear of the project, it would be because it's been billed in the media as like the homeless village, which is it's said in a positive way. But if I was a resident or a school in that local area, you might have a preconception that it'll be people just sat around antisocial or, or whatever, which, which won't be the case. Um, and the second one is that we've teamed up with a really brilliant local charity called the Serenians who are going to be managing that on-site support resource. Um, and I think it's really, really important that we do engage in lots of ways with the local community. Um, and we'd love to partner with your school in different aspects. There's a big walled garden next to it, so there's going to be lots of opportunity for like pla planting vegetables and do doing that kind of thing. Um, uh, you know, and just generally, we're really keen to explore ways to partner with key players in the local community, and, and we'd love to explore that with your school as well. Thank you, and I think we have another another question in the back. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, my name's Leslie Welsh from West Lothian Council. I'm a teacher there. And my question is, um, how can we as educators instill a more entrepreneurial attitude in our children? Um, <laughs> good one. <laughs> Well, I think there's there seems to be lots of like um, things out there. Like I, I met a woman called Sandra Ewan who does this social enterprise academy with schools, um, and that seems to be quite a good way of getting kids to uh, to you know go out and create their own little mini enterprises and raise some money. I think like getting involved, not to shamelessly plug it again, but if you get involved in our sleep out, then there'll be a fundraising requirement for kids. So we've, we've as a charity, but there are loads of other charities I'm sure will engage as well, um, and get, like to engage schools in supporting some fundraising. So I think something with like a payoff at the end, like a big event and a sort of fundraising challenge where each kid has to try and raise at least 50 pounds, then the sort of nature of that challenge in and of itself stimulates an entrepreneurial um, spirit so I think like it's largely it's a difficult thing to be taught but it's a very very easy thing to catch a bug for and um, so I think if you give people avenues and outlets and challenges where they have to do a bit of fundraising or create a product and sell it then it's I know for my own self it's quite addictive you know if once they do that and they they sell something and raise 50 quid or 100 quid then it's something that'll stick with them I think so I'd say it's difficult to be taught I guess but it's easy to create means of giving them a taste of it and then you know, they'll be off away on their own th thoughts after that. And I'm sure you'll agree, Josh is also an excellent role model for, for inspiring um, our, young, our young children. Um, uh, one final question. Have, has someone else got a burning question you want to ask at the end? Because I think, um, oh, did we have a question? Someone, uh, excellent, you're over on that side. Hi, Josh, I just wondered if you managed to get any funding through charitable grants from foundations and the lottery and stuff, or did you just go for it? Yeah, and we didn't uh, for about best part of five years, so we didn't, you know, we didn't even know about that whole world really. Um, yeah, we just kind of went for it and just really initially frantically tried to sell as many sandwiches as we could to keep the whole thing go alive. Um, but then as our social impact increase, increased and we started to take on increasing amounts of people from this background and give them out inc away increasing amounts of free food, 
then inevitably you struggle to sustain that entirely via uh, sales alone. So there does have to be a fundraising capacity to us as an organization now. Um, and recently we were successful in getting some funding from the Big Lottery, which is a four-year um, program, half a million pounds, which effectively employs a dedicated team of five people to provide the support required largely to the employees from that background. Um, so, you know, the story I told around John and everything else, that was all when we had no support resource other than what we could cobble together ourselves. So now we've got a dedicated five people across three cities um, focused on the more charitable aspects of supporting these individuals. So it's certainly, as we've evolved as an organization, an area that we've, you were keen to tap into and uh, allow us to sort of expand the work we do. Well, thank you very much uh, f for that. Thank you for an, an inspiring presentation.